Yeah, praise the Lord. My goodness. And that is such a tremendous truth, and it is absolutely a fact that God's great love for us, no matter what, what you may take away from anything in any service at any time, let me tell you, there's one thing that you should always, that I would love for you and want you to always take away, and that is how much God loves you. Because the enemy, the hurt whisperer, now he's gonna tell you that God doesn't care about you, he's forgotten you, he doesn't love you, he's punishing you, all of those kind of things, but that is not true. God loves you with the greatest love that you can possibly imagine, even when you are messed up. I mean, God doesn't just love you when you act right. God loves you all the time. You're full of pride, you're full of anger, you're full of hurt, resentment, whatever it might be, God, God still loves you in spite of every bit of that. And God saved us even though none of us deserved it. Amen? Amen, oh me? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, we're gonna finish up. By the way, let me just kinda, I, I don't do this very often, give you kinda like a, 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 a little common attractions kinda thing. But I'm not going to start talking about it. I'm not going to start talking. I just want to tell you that next week, I'm going to start a series out of the book of Daniel. And how many of you know the book of Daniel? You've read the book of Daniel. All right, two or three. Good. It'll be all be a surprise to you. Um, Daniel's tremendous Old Testament book. Daniel's one of, the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, along with Isaiah, most likely, in my opinion, two greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, talk more about Jesus than any of the others. Uh, um, Daniel's last, Daniel has 12 chapters. His last six chapters are all about prophet, prophetic things, most of which was fulfilled when Christ came the first time. But there's still some tremendous words. But I'm not going to get into the prophecy. I'm going to go in the first six chapters, and I'm going to let four kings of Babylon speak to, speak to us about pride. Um, there are four kings that Daniel served under in, ba in, in Babel, Babylonian captivity. And Nebuchadnezzar was one of them, and Darius was one of them, and Belshazzar, the writing on the wall, was one of them, and then the great deliverer Cyrus, uh, actually a Persian, Cyrus the Great. And it's, I'm so excited about it, guys. I'm serious. I, I started with it, and I'm just, I'm just excited about it. And uh, I, I really think the Lord's going to speak to us in this. Uh, it's like, again, I say, it's not about prophecy now. It's not, we're not trying to take Daniel and prophesy. We're, we're going we're to let the first six chapters, which are all about stories that you know, pagans that never even heard of God know about Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the fire furnace and the handwriting on the wall and those kind of things full of tremendous truth anyway there we go all right let's finish up what we're in today it's going to be a short one today all right you've heard that before right now you didn't you you can believe me today all right <laughs> even though i have no track record for telling you the truth about that um you can believe me today because i the reason i didn't finish it last week it's not such, such that it's so tremendously long or anything. It's just the fact that I didn't want it to just get zoomed over because it, it's a legitimate point. And it's an important thing for us to know, guys. This is an, look, all three of the truths in Matthew chapter 25 are warnings. They're for our good. They're for our benefit. God wants us to know this. And so he put it in the 25th chapter of Matthew all in the same chapter and said, all right, here are three examples of what I'm talking about right at the end of Matthew 24 when he said, all right, two gonna be working in the field and one's gonna be taken and one's gonna be left. Two women gonna be, you know, going shopping at um, supermarket or whatever, you know, grinding at the mill is what he said, but I know they don't grind at the mill anymore. But, but anyway, the modern equivalent of that and one will be taken and one will be left. And he said, so, so, so watch so that you, don't, that you don't get caught by surprise that this is going to happen. And then in Matthew 25, he says, all right, I want to give you three uh, truths, three examples, so that it'll, br it'll bring it home to you how vital this is and how quickly this is going to happen. And, 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 and if you're not ready, it's going to be terrible now. So I want you to be ready. And he tells, the he tells two parables and a true story. The first parable was about the 10 virgins. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. 
What made them wise and foolish? Well, the wise ones had oil for their lamp so that when the bridegroom came, which is obviously Jesus, by the way, I know that you know that, uh, he's talking about himself. When the bridegroom comes, it might be the middle of the night and you're gonna need a lamp. Well, if you don't have any oil in your lamp, you are going to be left behind, is what it boils down to. And the wise virgins uh, had their oil, and the foolish ones said, give us some. And they said, we can't give you any, because if we give you ours, then we're not going to have any. Go to the store and buy your own. And they went to buy, and by the time they got back, the bridegroom had taken the wise ones into the marriage chamber and shut the door. And they beat on the door and said, Lord, Lord. And notice they called him Lord. They thought he was their Lord. That's how deceived you can be, see? I mean, they call every, look, everybody in Matthew 25 that went to hell called Jesus Lord, every one of them. All the way through the whole, through the two parables and the story. They all thought that, they, that he was their Lord. That's the point of the thing. It's easy to be deceived about this. But once it happens, it's too late then. So he says, man, be ready. Like these wise virgins, man, you got, you know, it's all about a personal relationship because when they knock, they, the foolish ones knocked on the door, Lord, Lord, let us in. And he said, I don't know you. That's what he said. I don't know you. So the important thing to know about the 10 virgins is it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is what gets you to heaven. Nothing else. Nothing, you know, there, there are some basic things in Christianity, and the basic things are that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, that Jesus came to earth to die on the cross for our sins, and he was, and, and, and he was put to death on that cross, and three days later he rose again, and he went to heaven and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God and became the first of many brethren that will go to heaven when, we, when they die. That is essential. That is only thing that is essential. Everything else is non-essential. <laughs> what you believe about the gifts, I don't care what you believe about the gifts. I don't care what you believe about speaking in tongues and performing, you know, death raising things and, 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 and what hymns you like or songs or, or whether you like uh, uh, suits in church or stuff like this or you like chairs or pews or you want a choir or you don't like choir. I mean, I don't care about any of that stuff. None of that stuff is essential. The only thing that is essential is Jesus Christ is the Lord of our life. That's all that is essential. We can argue about everything else. Look, I'm not going to separate fellowship from you over what you like and what you don't like. I, I mean, really, I, I love you and I, I want you the best for you, but I'm not going to leave you because <laughs> you don't like some of the things I might like. But I, I couldn't really fellowship with you if, you if you didn't believe that Jesus Christ is God's son and that he's the one we need to believe we're going to heaven when we die. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a separator right there now. You can't really have fellowship. Jesus said no two can walk together unless they be agreed. So, I mean, that's a, that's a fellowship. That's a, that's a, that'll bust you up. So, no Jesus was the warning of the ten virgins. The second parable was about some talents Talent is a measurement of weight. Anything could be a talent. A talent of wheat, a talent of corn, a talent of gold, a talent of silver. It just means a measurement of weight. If you get a talent of gold, it's worth approximately two years' salary. So when the, when the, good, when the good owner gave his servant five talents, he gave him a lot of money. Ten Years worth, what? no, 20 years worth of money. My goodness, man, it costs two years for each talent? No, it's 10 years. Math, <laughs> math, somebody help me. Uh, it's math. Mm. <laughs> All right, 10 talents, uh, 10 years. That's still a lot of money. All right, and then he gave one, two, and one, one. But the point is, he gave everyone something. And then he went away. He said, all right, I'm going away. And when I come back, uh, there'll be a reckoning. You know, well, and so he went away, and they didn't know how long he was going to be gone. And so they just uh, took the talents that he gave them and invested them and did them and worked them and moved them and did all. And then when the master came back, the one that had five talents had made five more talents. There she comes for 20 years. 
five more talents. And then now he's got 10 talents. And then the one that made two got two more. So he doubled his. And the one that got one, he had his in the ground because he, he was afraid. He said, why'd you hide it in the ground? He said, well, I was afraid because my concept of you is different from these guys' concept. These guys' concept was God gave me something and I need to invest it. I need to use it because he expects me to use it. He gave it to me to use. He's a good master. He loves me. Uh, I, I want to I do this because I want him to be blessed and I want his, his kingdom to be blessed. That was their attitude. The one that buried it had a whole different attitude. His attitude was, look, I, I see you as a hard man. I see you as a man who really has some false expectations. That's what I'm really... I, I think that if you... You want something that you didn't really invest for, that you would hold me accountable for something that you didn't sow any seed, but you still want the crop. And I'm afraid, I was afraid, so I buried it. See, what, what, do, you, what do you think about the Lord? I mean, how you think about the Lord matters is what I'm saying to you. And Jesus said that we are to be ready because when the, when the good master came back, he he held them accountable for what he had given them. God has given every one of us gifts, talents, abilities, wisdom, opportunities. We live in the most blessed land in the history of the world. Some, we, we live in some of the best communities. We got nice homes. We got, we got comfortable lives. We got air conditioning, we got porches to sit on, we got breezes that blow by, we got, we got, we got sports to play, we got, we got all kinds of, we got great kids, we got, we got all of these things that God has blessed us with. And he just says, look, now, the reason I blessed you with that is so that you can use that to glorify me and expand the kingdom. What I gave you, what, what I want you to do is I want you to get out there and I want you to reflect me in such a passionate, positive way that when people observe you, they want to know what it is about you that makes you that way so that you can be attractive to them so that we can get them into heaven. See, you reflect me and we can get them into heaven. That's what he expects from us. Most Americans, uh, according to some surveys, and I quoted them last week out of the Barna Research Group, uh, they, they, were, they were new. They were August 2020 quotes now. I mean, it wasn't like 1956 stuff. Uh, according to Americans, most, 48% of Americans, almost half, really believe that the purpose of life is to feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. Feel good about yourself. In other words, God put us on this earth and our purpose is to live a life that will make us feel good about ourselves. Now, may I tell you that's not the purpose of life? I don't really have to tell you that, do I? That the purpose of life is to glorify God and expand his kingdom. That's the purpose of life. That's why he gave us all these things. That's why he gave us all these gifts. And when he returns, now hear, now hear this. When he returns, what, he, what he's going to expect is, what did you do with what I gave you to do with? All right. not, 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 okay, compared to Pastor Keith, how did you do? Uh. Or compared you know, to Bryn, how did you do? Or Lawrence, or, or any of us in here. How did you do? He's not going to compare us to each other. He's going to say, I gave you this. Now, what did you do with it? And whether it's a lot, I mean, whether he gave you a lot or a little or somewhere in between, I mean, that, that's, that's left to the Lord. Yeah. And you know how much he's given you. Now, I'm just asking you, uh, what are you doing with what he gave you to do with? I mean, uh, I mean what, 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 are we, what are you doing? Um, are you reflecting him? Uh, I, mean, are you, I mean, are you living a life where you think, man, you know, the purpose of life is to be popular or make money or have uh, uh, friends or, you know, uh, build a mansion? Or, I mean, what, what is it that you're doing? Because this is a warning. It's in Matthew 25. It's a warning. And it's saying, okay, look, you need to know this because you don't want to get caught off guard at the end. Now, you're not going to hell if you don't do a lot of stuff with what God gave you. 
If you have Christ in your heart, you've received him as your Lord, you've bowed yourself, you've humbled your pride, Christ is sitting on the throne of your life, you're going to heaven. So don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. You don't do good stuff to go to heaven when you die. And if you don't do good stuff, God still loves you. See, that is the amazing thing. You, look, do you guys believe that? That God, I, look, I'm telling you, you could be so lazy, a fly wouldn't even land on you. You, 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 could, be, you could be so gifted and so talented and so blessed by God that you ought to be you know, on top of the world somewhere shouting the glory of God and you laying on your couch eating you know, pig skins watching a football game. God still loves you. He, it's not a matter of that. And it's not a matter of, of you not going to heaven. It's a matter of wh what kind of presentation are you going to have? What, I mean, what kind of gifts are you going to have to lay at the feet of Jesus? What, what, what kind of rewards are they going to be? I mean, it, 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 Jesus is just saying, look, you need to know that, that there's some accountability that's expected from you. So use your stuff. Use it wisely. Don't sit in a church on a seat with talent and, and, and have you know, three or four people up here or in those rooms in there or whatever and, and they're wearing themselves out and you got all the gifts you need and you sitting in here. That's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What are you doing with what God gave you to do because Jesus said, it's, you're going to be accountable now. I'm holding you accountable. Yeah. That's what the parable of the talents is all about. All right, now... The next, the next story is not a parable. It's a true story. And this true story is about the end of things. It happens, I'm just going to tell you, because so, you'll, you'll see some things in the scripture, you need to know this. This true story happens after the battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Right when, when Jesus comes down and defeats the devil at the battle of Armageddon, the next thing that happens is the millennial kingdom, which is the 1,000 year kingdom of Jesus. Before, before at, at, tribula, at the end of tribulation, Jesus rescues Israel, saves them from annihilation, from all the evil of the world, and, and then he calls the nations before him. This is, this is called, this, this true story we're about to read right here, is called the judgment of the nations. It's also called the sheep and goat judgment. And you'll see why in just a moment. But I want you to know that this is really going to happen. This, this, this is a true story. And, and I'll just, I'll make a little comment or two as I read through it. But here it is in Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him and say, and, and me too, because it's going to be his saints too. Uh, all his holy angels really mean there's all of heaven's host are going to come with him. So when Jesus comes to fight the battle of Armageddon, we're going to come with him. We're already going to be there because the rapture took us seven years ago. We're going to be there and we're going to come with him. And I'm going to be standing about this far from Jesus when, when he tears Satan up at the battle of Armageddon. I mean, we're going to be all around. So this is what he's saying now. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on, the, on, on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, which are what? The sheep. So Jesus is going to say to the sheep, the one on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why, why are we going to get the kingdom? Why, why, are we going to get, why are we going to get blessed? I mean, we, these are people that have been in the tribulation. These are people that have lived through the tribulation period which is literally hell on earth. And now they're standing before the throne with Jesus on the throne. This is not the great white throne. It comes at the end of everything. Only lost people are there. It's not the bane of judgment only that Christ has. That's in heaven after the rapture. And that's the judgment seat of Christ where you get crowns for gold, silver, and precious stone lives. 
This is the judgment of the nations mm -hmm. after the Battle of Armageddon. And this determines what happens from this point on in these people's lives. Not our lives, we're already in heaven. Not lost people, they are already out. This is what happens in the lives of people that have done certain things. Now watch it, what they've done. This, it'll make, it, I'll make the point, I promise, but, but, but hang with me. All right. Then the king said to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So these people on the, the sheep are gonna go right into the millennial kingdom. They live through tribulation. There are human beings just like us, flesh and blood, had babies, had children. I don't know if they had any in tribulation. They'd be stupid too, but, but I don't know. They may have had some. But anyway, you're, you're a live human being. You're not a ghost. You're not a spirit. You're not anything. You're a live human being. You made it through. Well, now you're going to get to walk right into the millennial kingdom, which is the thousand-year kingdom where Jesus rules with a rod of iron, and it's going to be wonderful. It's where the Bible talks about the lion laying down with the lamb and both of them getting up, the little kids playing with the serpent and it's not going to hurt them. I mean, th this is a, a wonderful paradise type of thing for a thousand years. So these sheep are going to just walk right out of tribulation and walk right into the millennial kingdom. And, and, and here's why. The, the important thing is why. Why is this going to happen to them? All right. For, verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, yeah, yeah. you did it to me. Yeah. The least of the brethren yeah. are the Jews in tribulation. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of Israel in tribulation. That's what this is talking about. Yeah. Israel is going to have to live through the tribulation. The Antichrist is going to be trying to kill them. He's going to, be, he's going to make uh, Hitler look like a Sunday school teacher. And he's going to be hunting them down like dogs. He's going to be killing them when he finds them. He's going to be torturing them and, 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 and abusing them. He's a horrible, he's, he's Satan himself. Yeah. And somebody's going to have to help them. Somebody's going to have to feed them. Somebody's going to have to clothe them. Somebody's going to have to hide them. Somebody, somebody's going to have to start an underground railroad like, like during the slave days. Somebody's going to have to be compassionate with them or they're not going to make it. And Jesus said, if, if you were there and you helped these desperate people, I've got a reward for you. And you're going to go right on into the millennial kingdom. You're the sheep. But notice there's another group there. Then the righteous, oh, oh, verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we didn't minister to you? Yeah. Then he will answer to them saying, assuredly, I say to you in as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The nations are judged on what they did 
with disadvantaged people. Now, that's what this is about. That's where it goes. That's what it really is. So why is it in Matthew 25? We don't, I mean, that's not going to be us. We're not going to be judged there. There won't be any of us in there. Won't be, won't be anybody else that's died. Nobody, no one that's died is going to be in there. So why would he tell us? Why would this be? What, what, what kind of warning would this be? Well, I think I have the word of the Lord on it, and I'm going to just share with you what I, what I, why I think it's there. I think it's here because it has to do with, with people on this earth and the way we treat people. I think this is there because the Lord is warning us, you better be careful how you treat people. Because I know you might not love them and you might not care about them, but I love them. And you, you, you remember what I've said about loving things that someone you love loves? I told you, you know, I don't really, I'm not a big animal person. Tanya loves dogs. That's why we've had, had some all of our life. We've been married 43 years. We had a dog all, all the way. Why? Not because I love them, but she does, and I love her. So there you go. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to love the things I love. See, you know what he's saying? He's saying, the way you treat people reflects your relationship with me. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you can't say you love me and hate something I love. That's right, that's right. So he's warning it. Now, this is, like I said, this is not going to send you to heaven or hell. You can, you can go over and, and, and cuss out your neighbor every day, uh, 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 throw weeds in the yard, uh, you know, kick their dog. Uh, you, you can do all of that and go to heaven if you have Christ in your heart. Christ in your heart is the key to heaven. But what the warning is, is do you have Christ in your heart? If you can do these things that he's describing, you don't have him. He's saying, wake up, man. Wake up. If, if, this, if this describes you, then, man, you, you're not saved, and you need to doubt your salvation, and you need to get right because you're not going to heaven. You're going to be one of those that are going to be banging and saying, Lord, Lord. Remember, I said everybody in here called him Lord, which means everybody in here thought that he was their Lord. But he wasn't. And that's what the warning is. This is not a chapter telling you what you need to do to get saved. It's a chapter telling you what you do because you're saved. I don't do this in order to go to heaven when I die. I do this because heaven's already come and lived inside of me. And so this has to do with the way we treat people because it shows our heart toward God and you can't disassociate the way you treat people and your relationship with God. And I'll give you one really easy example to see. Peter gave it to us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Look at what he said. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, strength, that's what that's talking about, not, not character or anything. That's talking about physical strength. As to the weaker vessel, look at it, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, wh why? Why can't you be out of fellowship with your wife? Why can't you treat her in a disadvantaged ways? Because your prayers, that your prayers be not hindered. You know what that verse is saying? That verse is saying, look, if you are mistreating your wife, you might as well not pray because God is not listening to you. Now that, that's how vital this thing of treating people the way that Jesus would treat people. And what it is saying is if you mistreat your wife, God's not going to hear you because you can't treat people bad and think that you are not offending Jesus. When you treat people ugly, when you treat them bad, when you treat people harshly, you, you are offending Christ. Jesus is going, oh, my Lord. You know, man, 
I mean, he's offended by this. The way we treat people is telling us what's in our heart. It's telling us if we have a relationship with the Lord or not. So let me ask you a few questions. Are you a gracious person? Gracious means you give stuff away to people that don't deserve it. Are you a gracious person? Do you give stuff away to people that don't deserve it? That's what Jesus did. Jesus gave stuff away to people that didn't deserve it. We don't deserve his love, but he gave it to us, even though we didn't deserve it. And we do stuff every day to say we didn't appreciate it, you know? I mean, but he still gives it. Now, I'm not just talking about, I know some of you sitting here saying, man, I ain't fixing to go down there and find some poor person and give them some money. What about, what, about, what about kindness? What about love? What about, what about a, a, a positive word? What about a little respect? What, what about, what about a, a smile even, you know? A pat on the back, a, a hey brother, let me pray for you. I mean, some, some sweetness, some gentleness, some, something like that. I mean, it's, we, we're not talking about you have to give a bunch of money to people. To be a gracious person, it means you look for an opportunity to bless people who don't deserve what you're about to do. Oh, and I said kind. Let me just ask that question then. Are you a kind person? Kindness has lots of definitions, but, but here's the one I like. Harmless to others. You're a kind person if you are harmless to others. If someone is hurting if someone is suffering, I should be the safest person on the face of the earth for them to come hang around. Because I'm not knowingly going to say anything or do anything to make you hurt worse than you're already hurting because I'm a kind person. I overlook things that don't matter. I don't make mountains out of molehills. I, I don't, if it's not essential, then bless God, I, I'm gonna pat you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna love you because I'm a kind person. Jesus was a kind person. Are you a forgiving person? Do you know that every relationship that you have problems with, the only thing that's going to fix it is forgiveness. Did you know all of the hurts from the past that deal with your family or your loved ones or abuse or all, the, the only cure for that is forgiveness? You are never going to get over it if you can't forgive. Now, forgiveness does not mean admitting that they were right. They probably weren't right. They probably were dead wrong. But it doesn't have anything to do with whether they were right or wrong. It has to do with, am I going to get free from this or am I going to stay in bondage? Because you're the one in bondage. Unforgiveness holds sin in our heart, sin in our life. It sours us. It destroys us from the inside out. And I tell you how you, you, you say, Pastor, well, how, how, can I, how can I forgive somebody that I hate? Well, I can tell you because there's a few people I hate. I mean, man, they, I've had people treat me terribly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm gracious and kind and gentle and sweet and everything else. And y'all know how sweet I am. Yeah. But, I, <laughs> but, but I've had people treat me and ball like dirt, man. I mean, just horribly. Yeah. And man, I'm going to tell you what. For years, you know what I did? I kept, that, I kept them locked up in prison in my heart. Oh, yeah. And I'd drag them out every once in a while and beat them. <laughs> Work them over, put them right back down in there. And that went on for years. And I was the one that was sour, bitter, harsh. It, it affected me. And, and, and here's what I believe I heard from the Lord one day. Now, I'm not talking audibly. You know how I'm talking about this. I, my, I just sensed it in my heart. And when I read it in the Word, it just kind of jumped out at me. Here's what he said to me. Pray for them. Start praying for them. Pray and pray that I would bless them. 
That's what it was. That's what it was. Pray that I would bless them. Bless them just like you pray for, for me to bless you. With as much enthusiasm and as much reality as you pray for God to bless you, you pray that he would bless them. And then I said, well, God, I'm going to have a problem with this. Because if you actually do what I'm praying, then I'm going to be mad at you. I'm, I'm just being real now. And I said, and I, said I, I don't know if I can do this. He said, well, that's what you're going to have to do. And so I, 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 I reluctantly started. And I'm talking very reluctant. I'm talking about, I'm, 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 I'm going to him and saying, God, I don't want to do this. And you know how I feel about this. And I'm still just tore up about a mad man. They just, they've never even asked for forgiveness. They, you know, all that. And, but then I said, but Lord, you told me to pray for these horrible creatures. I mean, it took a, it took a few weeks to get, to get it where it, it, I wasn't mad every time I started and wasn't fussing and complaining with God, just being real. But eventually, eventually, I, I, I kept praying for them to be blessed. God bless their family, bless their children. Lord, give them, give them, give them good things. Give them favor in this world. Lord, help them, help them get that, that new job. I know, I know where they're going for it. Help, help them with that. Lord, give them favor with their boss. Give them. And before I knew it, I wasn't, I wasn't angry anymore. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't hostile about it. And I'm going to tell you what now, seriously. If you can't do that that I just said, you have unforgiveness in your heart. That's just a sign for you. You, are, you have unforgiveness and you're never going to get rid of it until you do what I just said right there. And mean it. Now, I'm going to tell you, it takes a while to mean it. I'm gonna, don't, go, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. It, 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 it ain't going to happen right off the bat, but you keep up with it. All right, forgiving. Do you help people who are vulnerable or in need? Like these people that Jesus was talking about in this story right here. Do you help people like that? People that, that are sick or in prison or not? I mean, do, 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 you, do you have any concern about people like that at all? Okay. Do you treat people with respect who are different from you? I mean, oh, we, hey, we love people that are like us, right? That, that like the same things we like and, and vote for the same people we vote for and go to the same church we go to and believe in the same spirits and all that and likes the same music. We, we like all that, right? We, we like people that like us. We like people that are like us. There's a refrigerator that, a quote that tells us that. Birds of a feather flock together. We love people that are like us. What about people that are not like us? What about people who don't vote for the same person you vote for? What about people who don't believe the same thing you believe? What about people that are of different races? What about people that are like uh, uh, guys, women, and women, men? I mean, the other gender. How, how do you feel about that? Are you, are you a chauvinist? I'm telling you, man, I, I was brought up in a world of chauvinism. I mean, call it what you want to. But when I came up, man, a woman knew her place. And a man bossed her around, did what? I mean, they'd come in, uh, kick those shoes off. She, she would pick them up and take them on in there. She'd be in there cooking in the kitchen and doing everything. And, be, and he'd be sitting in that recliner right there just watching the news. And, and, uh, and, and he'd just be saying, when is supper going to be ready? It's tight time. I want supper ready when I get... I mean, and she, she didn't call her lawyer or anything. <laughs> didn't hit him over the head with a pan or nothing. She just did it. Because that's what was expected. Is that you? You still like that? You still, you still think that, that somebody's lesser than you? That you have the right to boss people around and, and expect that out of them? See, I'm just saying, this, is what, this is, reflects what we believe and feel about people. And that's why Jesus put it in here so you would say, I, man, I need, I need to do something. I'm not, I didn't answer enough of those questions in the right way, man. I might be lost. God, am I saved? I mean, does your conduct, oh. Does your conduct on social media or in private conversations reflect the loving character of Jesus? 
Now, I'm not just talking about having a bad day here now. All of us can have a bad day, right? We can wake up on the wrong side of the bed. We can, you know, kick, we can, we can kick the bed post going out the bedroom and, you know, crippling around. We can, be, we can have one of those days. I'm not talking about the occasional one of those days. I'm not even really talking about driving. You know, driving is, uh, I, think, I don't think driving counts on any of the records for anything. Because, uh, yeah, you, you really better hope not. <laughs> Look, Tanya scares me when she drives. That's why she doesn't ever drive anywhere. I always drive because she scares me, I'm telling you. And now that she works at home all the time and doesn't have to actually get out into the traffic ever, her car's got about five miles on it in the last two months. Because she works at home and she, you know, and our church is a mile from our house and all, everything's right here. Well, she had to get out yesterday. She went out some two or three stores or something other like that. She came back home, boy, she was just boiling mad. I'm gonna tell you, I don't know, I don't know what it is about driving, but it's like your salvation leaves you or something. You know, it's like a it's like a demon jumps on you when you get behind the wheel. And people that are normally full of God and sanctified and sweet and gentle and loving and everything, man, they look like, you know, um, the devil's ex-wife, you know, um, <laughs> flying down the road. You know, I mean, just get out of the way. So I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about like when, when, when nobody knows it's you, and you can say what you want to say. What do you say? Do you let people know? I mean, do you give them a piece of your mind and you, and you belittle them and, and disrespect them and downgrade them? I, I mean, is, that, is that, the kind of, that the kind of person you are? I mean, you, you're ugly, you're hateful, you're mean. You're just a mean person. Well, if you are mean, mean and hateful and ugly like that, I think you need to doubt your salvation. Because I'm just, I, I just don't think Jesus lives in you if you like that. So that's what this is all about. Is your life characterized by no conviction about disregarding hurting people? I mean, you can just walk right on by. I mean, you can live around them, you, can, you and you don't even have one compassionate thought. I, I'm telling you, I, I, as an example, uh, you know, we live in a community back here, and my neighbors, all my neighbors are old. Um, and, and when I say old, I'm talking about like 80s, you know. I mean, they're they old people. And, man, I can see their yard looking nasty. I, I'll go over there and cut the yard. I weed eat it for them. I do whatever. I don't even know them. Because when I see people that can't do for themselves, I, I have some compassion for people that can't do for themselves. I thought, look, I saw something the other day. It was as funny as it could be. It was, but I, I felt so, I felt, I, 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 just, I just stopped and, and said, hey, I'll take care of this for you. I'll just weed eat it. You just... From now on, I'll just come by here about every week or two and I'll just take care of it, so don't you worry about it. Old woman, older woman, when I say old, I'm talking about way on up there, and she had green rubber boots on up to her knees and, and she had on uh, plaid pajama pants tucked down in the boots and a T-shirt. At least this did match, but she, her hair was all kind of puffed out white woman, she had red hair, uh, but real old, she probably dyed it, but anyway. Um, she had, she, she had a cigarette hanging out of her mouth. And she was, and, and you know, in the smoke, she you know how, whenever the smoke comes up and you know, you know like, and, and she had a, a, a weed eater, a little toy weed eater that plugged, that plugged in to the wall had like one little string on it and she was trying to weed eat down, down her driveway. So I said, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. If, uh, I, I thought if it wouldn't offend her, I would have taken a picture of her, you know, but, but I didn't want to do that. But, I'm, but, but, but that kind of stuff, man, I mean, do you, do, you, do, you, do you care about people? I mean, because this is talking about the Jewish people, I mean, just ask you a question. Do, I mean, do you support the Jewish people? Do you support the, the nation of Israel? I mean, how could we not? Jesus was a Jew. Do you know that? 
Mary was a Jew. The Bible's written by Jewish people. How could we not love them and pray for their best? You gotta, I'm gonna tell you, if you hate, if you hate Jewish people, uh, that's a reflection in your heart. If, as a matter of fact, it would be any people. I don't know how people can hate. How can people hate people just because they're a different color? How can that happen? How can it happen that because somebody has a different culture, people just hate each other? That's, that, that's, that's a sign. That, God ain't in that at all. That's, that's what this thing is saying right here. It is saying that what we do with other people tells us where we are in our relationship with Christ. That's what that says. And he's warning us to look at our life and make an evaluation of our own life as to whether we know him or not. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be caught by surprise on, on the rapture. Uh, I'm, I mean, it happens secretly, guys, by the way. I told you this, that the only people that know the rapture happened are the ones that get taken. Everybody else just looks around, they see the results, but it ain't gonna matter because the Antichrist is gonna tell them whatever and they're gonna believe it. You won't, you won't be sitting there, if you don't get taken in the rapture, you won't be sitting in your living room in your chair going, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart and save my soul. You won't be doing that. Mm-mm. You'll be, out, you'll be out in the yard with everybody else wondering what happened, hearing the message and going, yeah, I think the UFOs did get them. You know, I, I've been watching them. They're crazy people. But anyway, I've said that before. All right, let's bow our heads. Uh-huh.